Well, good morning, church family. So great to see uh, more and more people uh, coming. I, this is a regathering season of the church. It's not going to happen totally in the next week or two, but it is so encouraging to see people in person. And I'm excited about Easter coming up and uh, the invitation to join people. And again, feel free uh, for whatever reason you feel to stay worshiping with us online. And we always welcome our online Ohana, but this is a season where God is regathering his church and it's wonderful to have more and more in-person activity. The church is designed to be relationships and family together. So great to see that happening. And by the way, that was uh, such an encouraging uh, testimony from Brian this morning. Couldn't help but think, I don't know if some of you may have seen it. Uh, yesterday, I was just working on my laptop, getting some things done. I had the TV on the background and there was Alyssa, Brian's Probably, uh, he would say, his better half. There was Alyssa on TV. It was Kalo TV, and they were interviewing her. It was a half-an-hour show about being a mom, and a great interview. And so we've got a celebrity here in our midst as well. Um, um, see, uh, hopefully, I'll, I'll check, and maybe it'll be rerun sometime, but it was wonderful to see her share her heart and what God was doing in her life as a, as a mom and giving birth to their uh, firstborn ocean. So that was exciting. Well, I have a, uh, something I want to tell you about this morning that is an unseen reality. It's invisible. You cannot see it, but every one of us knows it's true. Every one of us uh, knows it exists, okay? Something in this physical order that you cannot see with your eyes, but there's no doubt it's real. Here it is. You ready for this? The internet. <laughs> the internet. Has any of you ever seen with your eyes the internet? No, and nobody online has seen it either because you cannot see it. It's invisible. But how many of you believe the internet is real? Would you raise your hand if you... Well, of course it's real. That's how you do your emails. That's how you do your communication. That's how you do your shopping. That's how we're doing church this morning because uh, a big number of our church family is tuning on through what? The internet. It's real. It exists. You just cannot see it. I want to show you a picture of it because I'm showing you of a picture of something you can't see with your eyes because that's not really an internet. It's just the internet. It's just a picture of the internet. It contains symbols. And those symbols communicate something about the reality that you cannot see with your eyes. And they're all meaningful symbols. Well, this morning we want to uh, remind you that as we study the book of Revelation, we are, we are uh, led into un seen realities. We are led into not unseen invisible realities in the physical realm, in this dimension of time and space. They're actually in another dimension. They're in the heavenly realm. They're in the presence of God. They're in the future. But they are nevertheless things that we cannot see with, their eyes, with our eyes, but they are absolutely real. And the Holy Spirit opens doors into heaven to show us those unseen spiritual realities. Last week we looked at Revelation chapter 4 where the second window in the book of Revelation is opened up. The second, it's actually a door, is opened up into the very throne room of heaven, into a place that you cannot see with your eyes. And I, I love the, I, the uh, image, if you can remember last week we looked at an aircraft carrier. 4.5 acres, this mammoth ship of sovereign U.S. territory. But what commands that mammoth ship? One small, uh, tiny command center, and we showed you a picture of it, it has a chair. And out of that command center commands the entire ship. Well, that's a physical image of what's going on in Revelation chapter 4, where we're lifted into the heavenly throne room, and there is a throne room. And um, the unseen heavenly reality is that our awesome God sits on the throne room of heaven and has absolute power over all of the universe. Our God reigns. The Lord God Almighty occupies the throne of the universe. That's the vision we're li lifted to. And he reigns with indescribable beauty. And he reigns with perfect truth. And he reigns with absolute power, sovereign power total power. That's Revelation chapter 4. This 
morning we're going to look at Revelation chapter 5, but Revelation chapter 5 and Revelation chapter 4 go together. And um, when I was chatting with Sean before the service, uh, I hope many of you picked this up because he said, Pastor, uh, are we in Revelation 5 this morning? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, you know, Revelation 5 really goes with Revelation 4. And I said, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So we're going to read Revelation 4 just as a review of last week, but then we're going to see what happens in the second part of this vision. As the door of the window to the door of heaven is opened up and we see that our awesome God reigns, we're going to see in the second part of the vision given to John by the Holy Spirit that there is a job search in heaven, that there is a job, there's a, there's a seeking after a qualified candidate who can carry out God's purposes on earth, God's purposes to judge and bring justice, God's purposes to rule and bring life. Who is it that's qualified to do that? That's going to be the second part of the vision. But uh, just listen as I read. These verses won't come up on the screen right now, Revelation chapter 4, but we don't want to separate chapter 5 from chapter 4. So just listen as I read chapter 4. It's only a few verses, and we'll be reminded of this heavenly vision given to John, this unseen reality that shapes the universe and shapes our lives as well. So here's Revelation chapter 4. It reads this way. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit, and there before me was what? A throne, a place of dominion, a place of power, a place of ruling, with someone sitting on it. The throne of the universe is occupied. Who's sitting? Well, someone with unimaginable beauty, because he goes on to describe it. The one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, these earthly beautiful gemstones, a rainbow that shone like an emerald and circled the throne. The Lord God Almighty is on the throne and he reigns with indescribable beauty. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. And we saw these are angelic beings, an order of angelic beings that represent God's redeemed people. Twelve apostles, twelve uh, tribes and, and the fullness of God's redeemed people. But they're not God's redeemed people because we see elsewhere in the book that they're distinct from God's people. But they're an exalted heavenly order of angels that are around the throne. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. He possesses terrifying power. Thunder and lightning, an electric storm that, that is terrifying. Um, that's the picture both from the book of Exodus and also here in Revelation. We're going to see later with the judgments. It's a terrifying power. In front of the throne, seven lamps. That's where we get the fact that he rules with perfect truth. Seven is the number of perfection of completion. Lamps illuminate. They send out truth. And he mentions the role of the Holy Spirit with that. These are the sevenfold spirit of God. He reigns with indescribable beauty. He reigns with, with perfect truth. Perfect truth flowing from heaven. And then he says this, in front of the throne, oh, also in front of the throne was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. And we saw that the sea in the Bible and, and in the culture was the place of chaos and death. And, and the beast comes out of the sea, all of the forces aligned against God. But in the heavenly throne room, that place of chaos and death and ruin and evil is transformed to smoothness and transparency because he rules over those chaos forces. And so he rules over all things, absolute power. And, for, and then he says, in the center around the throne were four living creatures. And they were covered with eyes in front of... Who are these living creatures? Well, we saw there another realm of angelic creatures who represent creation. The first was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Angel, each of, eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings, was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy. Absolute power, absolute purity. They're worshiping the Lord God Almighty. He is the Lord God Almighty. Pantocrator, 
rules over all things, over everything. He's the absolute king of the universe, and he exercised rule over all things. Who was eternal rule from the past? Who is absolute rule in the present? And who is to come? Absolute rule in the future. <laughs> Indescribable power, absolute power, perfect truth, and absolute beauty. All of those things are described in this vision that John has. And then what's the response we saw of all of these angelic creatures? Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, what the, happens? The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you're the creator. You created all things and all angelic creatures, all created order, all human beings, everything in creation owes their existence to the Lord God Almighty who reigns from the throne. By your will they were created and have their being. Now that was Revelation chapter 4. That was the awesome unseen reality that John saw, was lifted up to, that he shares with us. But as I said, the scene doesn't end there. It continues. And there is a job search in heaven. God is seeking someone who, and the, the, um, the symbol is a scroll with seals. But if you read the whole book of Revelation, you know that scroll with seals is looking at God's unfolding of his purposes on earth, of his bringing justice, of his bringing judgment, of him bringing uh, the end to sin and death and evil and destruction and all that's wrong with the world, all that's a force, and the, also the power to bring life and the new creation and to bring God's rule of his kingdom of heaven, his rule in heaven, which is perfect to earth with life and love and abundance and beauty. And so who's qualified to do that? That's the question in chapter 5, and it's represented by this scroll. So let's read together. Chapter 5, and we can read together on the screen. Then I saw, it's the same vision, he's lifted up into the heavenly throne room, in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, the Lord God Almighty. A scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. The perfect number of seals. And I saw a mighty angel, a powerful angel, proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll, scroll? Who is worthy? Who is capable? Who is able to bring God's kingdom of heaven to earth, to judge and to rule, and to bring God's redemptive plan to history? And um, who is the candidate who's worthy to do that? But look at verse 7. I'm sorry, that uh, verse 3. But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside. <laughs> There's no one capable. Now think about that for a moment. Surely there's someone capable in human history. I mean, there have been some pretty amazing leaders of nations and uh, people who have uh, exercised dominion. How about Alexander the Great? Wouldn't he qualify? How about one of the great Roman emperors? How about Napoleon? Or um, how about, if you know English history, King George III? Uh, what about Winston Churchill? How about who's the greatest American president? Wouldn't any of these people qualify to bring God's purposes to earth? Maybe Abraham Lincoln, maybe George Washington, maybe a great... And the answer is no. <laughs> None of them qualify. Okay, so there's no, no political leader, no world monarch that, that qualifies to bring God's purpose to earth. How about one of God's great servants? How about Moses? He was a pretty amazing man of God. He was used powerfully God. Wouldn't Moses qualify? The answer is no. Well, how about, how about Isaiah? How about Paul? Isn't there some servant of the Lord who would qualify? And the answer is no. No one qualifies. Well, how about an angel? How about Gabriel? He's, he's an amazing angel. He's sent by God with great announcements. Couldn't he bring God's kingdom to the earth? What about the archangel, Michael? There's no one qualifies. 
It says, no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll. There's no qualified candidate. And so what's John's response? Bitter weeping. I wept and I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Why would John be reduced to weeping? Because it's a colossal tragedy. The earth is going to continue with all of its wickedness, with all of its rebellion, with all of its evil, with all of its suffering, with all of its death. Think about that for a moment. And nobody can do anything about it. There isn't a worthy candidate. What about wars? Well, we, we're blessed to live in a, in a peaceful country, in a peaceful season. But you just look at the last century, World War I, all of these nations rise up, conflict, death, destruction, ruin. You think people would learn? A few years later, World War II, the whole world is at war, the evil of Nazi Germany, destruction, ruin, death. Think people would learn? Vietnam War, Iraq War, wars and wars and people dying and death and destruction. And there's no one who can stop it, and it's just going to continue on in human history. And John weeps. What about genocide? Are you even aware of some of the things that have happened just in the last hundred years? I checked out some of the data because some of it I knew from a distance, but you may not have known this. 1915, just a hundred years ago, you may have heard about the Turkish army systematically rounded up and exterminated one and a half million Armenians. Armenians. Ethnic cleansing. The Turks just decided, the Ottoman Turks, we're going to destroy this group of people. I had a wonderful prophet seminary, Don Sanukian, who was Armenian. And he had his ethnic um, background, his ethnic group almost wiped out because the Turks decided they wanted to destroy 1.5 million men, women, and children, and they just butchered them. What about 1932-33, the Holodomor, the Ukrainian word for killing by hunger. Did you know that Joseph Stalin cre created a famine, a man-made famine, and his whole purpose was to starve to death four to five million Ukrainians. Four to five million Ukrainians purposely murdered through death by starvation. Well, you know, 1939 to 1945, the next genocide in this last, just this last hundred years, Hitler's Nazi regime systematically murdered, intentionally rounded up and killed six million Jews. 1994, most of us are old enough to remember what happened then. In Rwanda, the Hutu majority tribe slaughtered an estimated one million people, men, women, children of the rival Tutsi tribe, in three months, one million people in three months, and you know how they killed them? With machetes. They literally butchered them. <laughs> this, goes, this is part of human history, the last hundred years. And, and is there anyone who can stop these wars? Is there anyone who can stop this genocide, who is, can stop this kind of evil on earth? And no one's found in heaven who can do that. And John weeps. Today, today, the Chinese government holds an estimated one to three million people, Ouijers, in concentration camps. And uh, the State Department just recently called it a genocide. And if you, you read, there are, there are eyewitness people who have escaped those camps who tell about things like harvesting of organs from prisoners, forced labor from the men. Children are placed in orphanages. Women are systematically raped and tortured. And they're given forced abortions and sterilization. That's going on today. Who's going to stop that? <laughs> Who has the power to stop this evil on our planet? No one's found, and John is weeping. And we should be weeping, too, that this kind of stuff goes on. And yes, to bring it a little bit closer to home, is there a genocide going on in the United States of America? Absolutely. It's called the genocide of abortion. Since 1973, and our government made it legal, there have been an estimated 62.5 million, 
62.5 million lives destroyed in the womb. And yes, without overstating it, there's a form of torture involved. Not only their, their lives are taken, but we know that they experience pain. Science tells us that that child in the womb experiences pain, and when their lives are destroyed, they feel pain and their lives are snuffed out. And what else are you going to call that but genocide? Do you think God looks down on that and sees that and he thinks he's the life giver, is pleased with that? It's evil. Let's call it for what it is. And by the way, whether we like it or not, you and I participate in that. One of President Joe Biden's first executive orders was to overturn a previous order and to send our tax money to support abortions. So if you're paying taxes, and I'm not saying don't pay your tax, we, we just get caught up in that. We're, we can't just look at evil. We're part of the system that does that evil. And um, it's a matter of record. A few years ago, an investigative journalist um, taped privately public conversations at a lunch with Planned Parenthood executives and had them talking about organ harvesting of these babies that were being destroyed in the womb. And um, the California prosecutor, when that became public, did not prosecute the Planned Parenthood executives, she prosecuted the investigative journalist. And you know who that lady is. It's the vice president of our nation, Kamala Harris. She was at that time. This is, this is the evil in which we live in. So we're all, our nation is a part of it. We can't just look at the Chinese or the, the uh, Hutus. The point is this. There's no one found in heaven who's able to bring an end to this evil. No one has the power to stop it. No one has the power to bring life and health where there's death and destruction and ruin and evil. And that's why John's weeping. But <laughs> that's the end of the sermon. Let's go home and weep. No, it's not. <laughs> Keep reading because there is a worthy candidate. And as John is weeping and lamenting that there's no one found on he in heaven, on earth, under the earth who is qualified to bring justice, to bring God's rule, to bring the kingdom of heaven and life and love to earth. An angel comes up to him and says, stop weeping, John. There is a candidate. That's the good news. Look at this. The qualified candidate. And John sees a lion and he sees a lamb, but it's the same person. And you know who that is. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Stop crying, John. See, take a look. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He's talking about Jesus that God had revealed right back in Abraham's time that a king would come and he would come out of the, the line of Judah. And later he entered into a covenant with David, Israel's greatest king. And he said, out of your descendants, David, will come someone who will rule over my people forever. He's talking about Jesus the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is able to open the scroll and seven seals. He's the king with power to do that. But then he says this, then I saw a lamb. What? I thought you saw a lion. Yes, but then I saw a lamb. It's the same person. Looking as if it had been slain. Now, in the days of sacrifices, they would slay. It's a little bit gruesome, but what they would do is they would cut a lamb's throat and drain the blood and take the life by cutting its throat. So whether he saw this lamb with a cut throat and bleeding, I don't know. Or I wonder if whether that lamb had, had um, marks of blood on its head, uh, where they put a crown of thorns in Jesus, maybe wounds on his feet, I don't know. Doesn't say, but a lamb who looked like he was slain. And of course it's Jesus. But it's Jesus as the the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. That's how John the Baptist saw him. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. He's central to God's absolute rule over the universe. And he also was encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the... Oh, don't, let's not skip over that. We'll come back to it, but don't miss this. This is not any ordinary lamb. I've seen a lot of sheep, but I've only seen sheep with two eyes. And none of them had any horns. Um, the lamb that John saw had seven horns, 
seven eyes, we'll see the significance of that, which are the sevenfold Spirit of God sent out into all the earth. He went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. He is worthy. He is qualified. He's the one who is capable of exercising God's rule of judgment and rulership on earth to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, if you will. And what's the response? Well, there's this explosion of worship. It starts with those angelic realms centralized around the throne, but then it spreads to all the angels, and then it spreads to all creation. And there's this universal response of worship to the Lamb. Let's read it. When he had taken it, Jesus, the Lamb, the Lion, takes the scroll. He's qualified. What happens? The four living creatures and the 24 elders, these angelic orders of worship around the throne, they fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people, and they sang a new song, saying this, You are worthy, Lord Jesus, to take the scroll and to open its seals. You are worthy of judging and ruling on earth and carrying out God's purposes for all of history. Because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked. So it starts with those angelic orders of worship around the throne, but it spreads. And then it says, uh, verse 11, I looked and heard the voice of many angels, countless angels, myriad of angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They circled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice they were saying. What are they doing? They're worshiping too. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. But it doesn't end there. Then it goes to all creation. Then I heard every creature, all of creation, in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, all that is in them saying this, all of creation, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. You've got this universal response of worship to the Lamb and the Lord God Almighty on the throne. Now I want to take a few minutes to say, why does Jesus qualify? Why is there one person who meets the criteria of that job search, who qualifies, who is worthy to be God's judge and ruler over all things. This text points to four things that I want us to highlight. Number one is this. Why is Jesus Christ worthy to judge and to rule? And by the way, why is he worthy of our worship? Why is he worthy of us joining in with the angels, with all of creation, and worshiping worthy as the Lamb? Well, here's the first reason. He possesses perfect knowledge. Perfect knowledge. That's the whole point of the seven eyes. Seven is the number of completion, of perfection, and eyes are the instrument with which you see. And this is the way of saying that this lamb has seven eyes. He has perfect knowledge. He sees all things. He has, the theological term, omniscience, <laughs> omniscience. He sees perfectly everything. There is no, no knowledge that he does not have. That qualifies him to judge because if you compare that with any earthly judge... He has all the facts. <laughs> when there's a judge, when there's a trial on earth, guess what? There's a judge, there's a jury, but the facts are presented. Sometimes the facts aren't allowed to be presented. Sometimes all the facts aren't known. And sometimes justice doesn't happen <laughs> because aren't all the truth isn't exposed. I mean, I can't help but think of... Um, his name escapes me right now. The football player got away with murder. Who's that? No, no, the uh, O.J. Simpson. Okay, I know it was a number of years ago. O.J. Simpson. Everybody, the guy was guilty. But he hired high-powered lawyers. And um, for whatever reason, 
most people, I think, understand justice did not happen. He walked, even though he committed bloody murder. Justice doesn't always happen on earth. Sometimes the facts aren't presented. Sometimes there are other issues. <laughs> not with Jesus. Jesus knows all the facts. He knows everything that happened. He is in, by the way, um, he knows exactly what happened in Rwanda. He knows exactly what's going on in China. He knows exactly what's going on in the hospital rooms of our country. He knows everything. And he's in the perfect position to judge because he has all the facts. He has perfect knowledge. Can I say he also has perfect knowledge of your life and my life, and that ought to strike the fear of God into our lives because he knows everything that has happened in your life that will happen in your life. And there's a lot that will convict me. But he has perfect knowledge. He is worthy to judge, not like any other human person or any angelic creature. Jesus sees perfectly, and he's qualified to judge. But that's the first one. The second one is this. He possesses perfect knowledge, but in every place. That's the whole point of the sevenfold Holy Spirit sent out where? Into all the earth. We don't know what's happening in other parts of the planet. He sees everything because the sevenfold fullness of the ministry of the Holy Spirit who shines truth and represents uh, Jesus and is, you know, you have the triune God in all of this. You have the, the God, the Father Almighty. You have Jesus, the Lamb. You have the sevenfold spirit. All of the, the triune God are involved in this and, and Jesus has omnipresence. <laughs> he is in every place and he sees everything that happens. Um, and that qualifies him to judge because he has all the facts, and he has seen everything that happens in every situation. So he's qualified to judge just by that. But thirdly, sometimes what happens with human judges is, or even human evaluations, we don't have the power to do anything about it. We know it's wrong, we know it's evil, but what can you do about the Ouija's? What can I do about the Ouija's? Well, there's some things we can pray, we can give, we can petition, but we have no power to go over there and change those concentration camps directly. And sometimes there are other places of injustice where we feel like, yeah, there's things we can do, certainly not to minimize prayer, because God can change those things. But in terms of our own personal power, we have no power to change that wickedness, that evil that's happening on earth, that injustice. Jesus possesses perfect power. That's the point of the seven horns. Again, seven, perfect completion. Horns is a sign of power, symbol of power. And the lamb who was slain possesses absolute power, perfect power. Now, that shouldn't surprise us because we read from historical records in our Bible that Jesus demonstrated perfect power. He demonstrated power over creation. He walked on the waters. He spoke, and the waters and the winds calmed. You try doing that sometime. He had power over physical creation. He had power to create. He took a sack lunch from a boy, and he fed thousands of people. He created food and fed the, the physical needs of thousands of people. He had, power over his, he had power over the spiritual realm, if you will. When demons came in contact, fallen angels with wickedness, when they came in contact with Jesus, they fled. And they obeyed him instantly because they knew his authority, they knew his power. He had power over disease. Blind people, lame people, uh, lepers, he healed them instantly. Power over disease. And um, yes, power over death. <laughs> power over death. 12-year-old girl, Jairus' daughter, raised her from the dead. Lazarus, three days in the tomb, friend of the family, called him out from the dead. And ultimately, what we're going to celebrate on Jesus, on, on Easter, was Jesus himself rose from the dead. He had absolute power while he was here on earth, and he possesses absolute power. Now. He has not only the knowledge, but he has the power to make things right. Now, he hasn't done it yet, and we pray that he's working to do that now in our day, but when he comes... <laughs> And this is what the book of Revelation comes. He is qualified. He has the knowledge. He has the power. He will be able to bring an end to disease. He will be able to bring death to wickedness, to evil, to rebellion, to abortion, to genocide, to wars, to racial injustice, to everything that's wrong with the world. 
He has the knowledge and he has the power and that makes him qualified to judge and to rule on earth. But there's one last thing, don't miss this. He's qualified because he has perfect knowledge. He has perfect knowledge in every place. He possesses perfect power, absolute power. He can make things right. He can create the new creation. But don't miss the last one. He is perfect love. <laughs> He's perfect love. And that qualifies him to rule and to bring the kingdom of, because God is love. And he desires all men to be saved. And you read the rest of Revelation and there's going to be great judgment. He's going to pour out the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments. And there's going to be great judgment on earth. And he's going to do away with wickedness and evil and rebellion and suffering and death and genocide and hospitals and cancer and, and all of these evils that are part of the world where John was weeping because who can deal with all of that? And the answer is Jesus can. He has the power and he has the love and he desires all men and women to be saved. He desires all people to be saved. He gave his life and it's a beautiful thing. Don't miss this. He is the lion. He rules with power. But the emphasis is he's the lamb. He's the slain lamb. And what's behind that? He gave his life. He shed his blood for one reason, because he loves you because he loves me. He rules with absolute love. He is love. What greater love is there than Jesus? There is none. He gave his very life, and he saw you in your spiritual need, and he saw me in my spiritual need, and he was moved with love and compassion. Not just power. He has all power, but he, he came to this planet, and he said, I'm going to give my life for people to free them from their sins so that they can be part of my new creation, so that they can belong to me, so I can adopt them as my children. And yes, when he came to the cross, and we're going to conclude our sermon, our service this morning with communion. He said, remember me with this. My body, my blood. I'm the slain lamb who takes away your sins because I love you. And um, to make it a little bit personal, when we celebrate that communion, let me remind you that he knows everything about your life. He knows everything about my life. He loves you enough to forgive you. Whatever happens in the past, whatever happens today, whatever happens in the future, he gave his life to forgive all of our sins. And so when they nailed his hands to the cross, and the one with all power laid down his power and let wicked people torture him to death, he gave his life as the slain lamb. The lion allowed wicked people to torture him to death. And he became the shed blood of the lamb. And when they nailed his hands to the cross and blood flowed from his hands, he was forgiving the sins of everything you have done that you should not have done, all of your actions, as well as all of your actions you should have done that you never did. And he died for mine too. He shed his blood. And when they nailed spikes into his feet and blood was shed from his feet because he was the lamb who was slain, and his blood was shed. He suffered for all of the places you've gone in life, you should have never gone there. And he's suffered for all of the places you should have gone, and you never went. And me. He shed his blood because he loves you. And when they jammed a crown of thorns on his head, and he bled from his scalp and his head, and the lamb shed his blood from his head, he was suffering and dying paying the price for all of the thoughts in your head that were wicked, that were evil, that you should never have had. And he also paid the price for all of the good thoughts that you should have had that you never had. He paid the whole price. And yes, when they took to see if he was dead and they took a spear and they, they, they uh, thrust it into his side, into his heart, and water and blood flowed out. And his blood was shed. His blood paid the price for all of the evil intents of your heart. Because he knows everything. He knows when you did the right thing, but you had a wicked motive. Because he sees into your heart. He knows everything. He has perfect knowledge of you and me. And he also knows when you should have had a good motive. When you should have had a right motive, but you never did. Might have been selfish. You might have looked like you were doing the right thing, but your heart wasn't right. We all know what that's like. 
And Jesus says, I know everything about you, Rick, and I love you enough that the shed blood of the lamb covers everything. And that's why the lamb is worthy to judge and to rule, and that's why we worship him and love him, because he has redeemed us, and the judgment that was rightfully to be poured out on my life, that will be poured out on the earth, when all of wickedness and evil and immorality and genocide and death and disease, when all of that will be dealt with, that he has the power to do, it was all poured out on Christ on the cross, my personal part of the judgment, so that I'm part of that heavenly being even right now that's worshiping him, that's saying worthy is the lamb, a kingdom of priests, a kingdom of servants to God, part of his family, represented in heaven. That's my identity, that's my destiny, that's who you are. And it's all because he loves you. He rules with absolute love. So what do we do this morning? We're going to conclude our service. We're going to join this universal chorus, Worthy is the Lamb. And as the worship team comes forward, we're going to sing songs that, that, that uh, exalt Jesus, the one who loves us, the, the Lamb who was slain for your sins and for my sins. And then we're going to celebrate communion to close the service. I'll come back and lead us in a prayer. And by the way, if you didn't pick up a communion emblem on the way in, if you just raise your hand, one of the ushers will bring one to you and you can celebrate communion with us. Let's stand together, join our worship team, join the heavenly angels, join all of creation in singing, worthy is the Lamb, our Lord Jesus Christ.
is not like you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice that you made. Thank you for reminding us that you alone are worthy, that you are the only one found worthy. We worship you, God. Let's sing, church. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the cross.
Lord Jesus, we truly join that chorus, that universal chorus. We recognize those exalted orders of angelic creatures around your throne are bowing down and worshiping you and recognizing how worthy you are. And countless myriad of angels we can't even imagine flying all over heaven, singing that chorus, worthy is the Lamb. And indeed all of creation and the day will come where every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But now, Lord, we join with all of creation. We say, worthy is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that, yes, you're the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But as we take these communion emblems, we thank you that you're the Lamb of God who takes away my sins. We stand at the foot of the cross, Lord Jesus, and we marvel at your love for us. That you would come into our world, that you would see us in our spiritual need, and that you would love us with a love that would give your life, that would shed your blood, that would allow your body to be broken. And as you suffered for all of the sins of the world, all of ours and all of humanity, thank you that you not only love the world, but that you love me. I accept that love this morning, Lord, as I receive these elements. Thank you that the Lamb of God who has power to, to rule and to bring God's rule to earth with life, and to bring an end to all death and wickedness and disease and evil. Thank you that that love reigns over our lives now. And Lord, we recognize we take these emblems until you come, at which time we will reign with you and we'll see the perfection of your power and your love in this universe as you create a new universe, a new heavens and a new earth. And we look forward to that day when you will make all things right because you see perfectly and you have power to make things right and you have love to bring life and, and prosperity and, and freedom and joy in the presence of God in the new creation. So Lord, as we take these emblems, we're grateful that we belong to you. And again, for the love of the lamb who shed his blood for me, we give you thanks. Let's take this emblem. Father, as we receive these emblems, we receive into our beings, into our bodies, into our spirits, the love that you have shown to us, the forgiveness of sins, the gift of eternal life, the indwelling spirit reigning with Christ in the future, every spiritual blessing that you've bestowed upon us. And we say together, now unto the King, immortal, invisible, God only wise, God only loving, God only powerful, be honor and praise and glory church let's worship him this week in a manner worthy worthy of the lamb in jesus name and god's people said